Um, we'll begin our doctrinal class this morning uh, with a word of prayer. But before we pray, I would like to read a portion of text from the book of Psalm, Psalm chapter 48. Psalm chapter 48. We'll read from verse 1 to 3. Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised. In the city of our God, in his holy mountain, beautiful in elevation, the joy of the whole earth, is Mount Zion on the sides of the north, the city of the great king. God is in her palaces. He is known as her refuge. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we approach you this morning with our hearts filled with gratitude. That you, Lord, have afforded us the privilege of gathering with your people on this Lord's Day. For indeed, Lord, you have called us out of, out of darkness. You've called us out of the world. You've called us unto yourself. And unto you shall the gathering of your people be. Oh, that we, we ask that you will pity us and forgive our many sins, O oh Father, and receive us. Oh, that you will bless our gathering together this morning and a few minutes we'll spend looking at your word. May this time indeed be a time of refreshing for your people. Open our eyes to see the king in his beauty and in his glory. In Jesus' name, amen. So today we hope to wrap up paragraph three of the confession. Uh, paragraph three of chapter 26 of the London Baptist Confession of Faith, 1689. Two weeks ago, we began the study on paragraph three but we started with the part B, where we examined the thesis statement that Christ has always had a kingdom. And we saw that Christ has always had a kingdom by his appointment as the federal head and as the mediatorial king of God's people, and by his purchase through his blood, and also by his conquest as the reigning Mediterranean king in the world. Then last week we examined uh, part B in its full context when it says that Christ always had had a kingdom in the world and that Christ always will have a kingdom in the world. We examined this kingdom and we, we examined the three aspects of Christ's kingdom or the three spheres of Christ's kingdom or the three realities of Christ's kingdom. It is one kingdom, right? Um, we, in this world, we have the kingdom of providence and the kingdom of grace. The kingdom of grace is where Christ's rule and reign is visibly seen in the lives and hearts of his people as he saves and effectually calls them to salvation. And his providential reign is also for the good of his church or to accomplish his meritorial purpose. And then we said the third is the kingdom of glory where Christ's absolute reign 
will be seen and felt in the world, where the kingdom of this world will become the kingdom of our God. However, after um, the worship service last Lord's Day, a brother asked a question, I don't know if we all remember, around which kingdom did Christ come to inaugurate, right? Uh, it was after we left that it dawned on me that the, the un, the, there is an implicit assumption in that question that the kingdom of glory, the kingdom of grace, and the kingdom of providence are three types of kingdoms. No, it's just one kingdom, but three aspects, okay? Three aspects. Um, we see a picture of this in the Bible. Uh, we all recall the account of David, isn't it? When was David anointed king? Huh? In his father's house, isn't it? But did he assume the throne? Rather, he was the king of Israel, but he was in the wilderness. But there was a Saul occupying the throne. Right? Until a time came, Saul was dislodged, and he was then fully coronated as the king of Israel. So also Christ, having been appointed by the Father as the meritorial king of his people, was the king of the world. However, he was a king of the church in the wilderness. The full coronation happened after the resurrection. After he ascended and sat at the right hand of God the Father, there he was fully coronated as king. Are we following? And he's reigning even now in the midst of his enemies. Are we following? So, Christ had always been the king of his people before and after the cross. Okay? But the coronation happened after the resurrection. Okay, so that's just um, by way of uh, introduction. Today, we hope to address the first paragraph of the confession. And the first paragraph says, the purest churches under heaven are subject to mixture and error. And some have degenerated so much that they have ceased to be, church, to be churches of Christ and have become synagogues of Satan. So in this uh, third bit, we hope to address the question of the church in, in this world, the church in this world. Um, just to ask, I mean, um, Ray Eliezer had, had taken us um, through this um, when he took paragraph one and two. Um, so maybe I shouldn't even ask it as a question. So, I mean, the, no, let me ask, what's the meaning of the word church? What's the meaning of the word church? Any, anybody want to try? I mean, we're all in the class together when he taught it, so. Oh, oh, oh okay. Um, I think it means um, members of the body of Christ in the collective sense. I think he spoke of the invisible church mm -hmm. and then the visible church. Invisible church meaning everybody that is a member of the body of Christ in different places, that universal church then, also local smaller assemblies like this. And I think also in a sense where it means each and every one of us uh, individually. I'm, I don't know if I'm going off course. Okay, all right, thank you, thank you. So that word, um, church, means the called out assembly, right? The called out assembly. Um, the, the English word church also has uh, its origin from the 
um, Scottish and Greek word, which, which means um, kek and catch, right? Which was derived from um, the, the Greek word kurios, right? Which means Lord, right? Um, but the church is used to describe a called out people, a called out assembly. And it's important to note that the word is the called out assembly, right? In a sense, there is no private Christianity. Christianity is communal, right? I mean, we see that we see that the rise of that in our age. I happen to have a friend. Uh, I think the few times I went to Abuja, you know, these are they call themselves disciples. They don't. They don't. They're not members of any church. They don't attend church, but they kind of have some meetings where they meet with their disciple. And I was a bit confused, right? You know. And again, it comes from a wrong understanding of, um, of the church, right? The church is the call that assembly, the call that assembly. And God in his wisdom has organized his church, you know, as the means by which he will reveal himself and also advance his reign. In the... In the psalm that we read before we started the doctrinal class, the psalmist was talking about Jerusalem, which is a type of the church. And in speaking about the glory of the church, begins with the glory of his Lord. It says, Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised in the city of our God, in his holy mountain. Beautiful in elevation, the joy of the whole earth is Mount Zion on the sides of the north, the city of the great king. It calls Jerusalem the city of the great king. The church is the city of the great king. It's his church. Jesus said, I will build my church. God has chosen to identify himself with this people. And he and and calls them the city of our God. He says, God is in our palaces. He is known as her refuge. So God has revealed himself and have made himself known in and through the church. God has chosen that only through the church will he lavish his grace in the world. Every other person in the world may benefit from his providential reign, but they will know nothing of his grace. His grace is only resident amongst his people. So when Christ assumed the office of the mediator, it means that he became the, the go-between between God and man. That all the favors and blessings that would come from the Godhead to humanity will pass through him. Yes, all the blessings, both temporal and spiritual, comes through Christ. Those who know not Christ, they don't know that he is the one who blessed them with children. Same Christ is the one who is upholding all things. Blesses them with good jobs. Heals them when they are sick. But they know nothing of him. When they are awakened in death, they will say, ah, so God was in this place and I never knew it. They were in the world without God and without hope. Yet, it was in him they lived and moved and had their being. But the church is privileged to know him who rules the world. To know him specially. To know his grace. And all the graces and all the favors, the special graces, are communicated to the church through the meritorial offices of Christ as their king 
and as their priests and as their prophets. As, as the prophets of the church, Christ teaches his people. He instructs them in the ways of God. He teaches us so that we can truly and savingly know God. Not just to know about him as the unbelievers who only at best can tell you that they know something of his existence because his invisible powers and attributes have, made, have been made clear through his creation. But they do not know him truly. They can't call him father. Right? They do not know him truly. They do not know him savingly. Only in the church do we see the people of God knowing their God truly and savingly in Christ. And as our priests, we have our sins pardoned. We know what forgiveness of sin means. We know that there is forgiveness with him and that rebels can repent and turn to him and they will find pardon. And that's the good news that we go tell people, isn't it? That, oh, we rebels can now come back to God. Yes, he was angry, but now he has made a propitiation for us. If you come, you know, through faith in his son, he will receive you. Lay down your sword and bow your knees to God's anointed king and he will pardon you. He is gracious. And as our king, he rules over us, defending us, and also causing us to walk as his representative and citizens, as we obey his law and word. Amen. So, we come down to the church in the world. In previous classes, we had looked at um, one of the theological covenants, which is the covenant of redemption, right? which is the covenant between God the Father and God the Son. Do we all remember? Do we all remember? Why are we all looking? looking do we all remember? Huh? Turn your Bibles to Psalm 110 with me, please. Psalm 110. Psalm 110. Are we all there? Okay, I read from verse 1. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. The Lord shall send the rod of your strength out of Zion. Rule in the midst of your enemies. Your people shall be volunteers in the day of your power. In the beauties of holiness from the womb of the morning, you have the dew of your youth. The Lord has sworn and will not relent. You are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. I mean, okay. Uh, Radeva, thank you. I mean, Radeva, I'm sure you... There was a day where you made some vows to our sister queen. Right? You both made a vow in the presence of many witnesses, right? Do you still remember the content of that vow? Huh? Okay. So, in verse 4 that we read, the Lord, Yahweh, swore to his son, made a vow to his son. And we would say that 
the vow that our sister queen and our brother made uh, in the presence of many witnesses, right, became the basis of their union, isn't it? I would say that the marriage is a covenant, isn't it? So we see the father here saying that he swore. All right? He swore. And what was the content? He said to the son, you are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. And in Zechariah, look at Zechariah 6. Are we there? Zechariah 6. Read verse, maybe for context sake, I'll just read from verse 12. Then speak, then speak to him, saying, thus says the Lord of hosts, saying, Behold, the man whose name is the branch, from his place he shall branch out, and he shall build the temple of the Lord. Yes, he shall build the temple of the Lord, he shall bear the glory and shall sit and rule on his throne, so he shall be a priest on his throne, and the council of peace shall be between them both. We're introduced to the man whose name is what? The branch. And this man is a priestly king. Right? Behold, the man whose name is the branch from his place he shall branch out and he shall build the temple of the Lord. Yes, he shall build the temple of the Lord. He shall bear the glory and shall sit and rule on his throne. So, shall, so he shall be a priest on his throne. A priest who is sitting on a kingly throne. So this man who is called a branch will be a priestly king. Are we following and he now says that the council of peace shall be with this man who is the priestly king and Yahweh. That this council of peace, this pact, this agreement, this covenant between the priestly king and Yahweh is what we refer to as the covenant of, rede of, of redemption. Are we following? So there was a pact, there was an agreement, there was a vow between God the Father and God the Son. There was a pact of peace, a council of peace between the trin amongst the Trinity that the Son will be appointed to be the mediator of God's people. John Flavio gives two reasons why Christ was appointed. He said, first, Christ is the natural Son of God, and as such, he was fit to bring in many sons into glory. And second, he's the second person of the Trinity and, and would, was fit to be the go-between between the Godhead and uh, humanity. But here we see, I mean, there are three theological covenants, right? And they are called theological because you will not see anywhere in Scripture where it's called a covenant, right? But just like the, the idea of Trinity, it's there in Scripture. If you read the Bible, the idea of Trinity is there, isn't it? But you never see the word Trinity, okay? So it's theological because it's, it's, it's there in Scripture, but you won't find that word covenant, okay? So this covenant of redemption becomes the basis of all the salvific covenants we see revealed in time. Are you following? Right from the garden where God revealed the covenant of grace as a promise, as a promise, in Genesis 3.15. The covenant of grace is dependent on this covenant of redemption. Are we following? Because if God had not 
appointed the son and there was no agreement to save in eternity past, which was hidden, right? In the bosom of God, right? No, none of us had access to it. But the Spirit of God, who knows the mind of God, has revealed them to us through inspiration of Scripture. So we now have it written. And it was revealed to us in time as the covenant of grace. Are we following? And we see the covenant of grace revealed in Genesis 3.15 as a promise. And it was further unveiled as time went on through the Abrahamic covenant, the Davidic covenant, right? God was speaking about the same covenants. And it's this same covenant of grace that was then fully ratified by the blood of Christ as the new covenant. And it's that new covenant that Christ stands as mediator between God and man. Are we following? Are we following? So I've explained two theological covenants. The covenant of redemption, covenant of grace. There is the third one, I will, you, you, I, will leave that, I will give you that as a homework, which is the covenant of works. That's the third theological covenant, right? Um, but all the other revealed covenants in Scripture, the Adamic, the Mosaic, the Abrahamic, the Noahic, the Davidic covenants, right? I will leave it to you to go find where do they belong, covenant of grace or covenant of works, right? And maybe one more assignment, covenant of redemption, is it covenant of grace or is it covenant of works? That's an assignment for, for everyone. And if, if you are finding troubles, please see Brother Eliezer. <laughs> okay. Um, so, why did we go back to covenant of grace? So, covenant of grace was revealed in Genesis 3.15, right, where God made a promise that the seed of the woman would bruise the head of the serpent. That a day is coming where mankind will crush Satan. And we are helpless. So the God man had to come to our aid. He was rightly that seed of the woman who crushed the head of the serpent. And a day is coming when the, when the church will have the serpent under its feet. And that prophecy and that promise will be fully fulfilled. So, Christ had always reigned over his church. And Christ had always had a people. Right from the fall, the gospel was revealed. It wasn't an afterthought. The gospel was revealed. And it's through the gospel preached that Christ sets up his throne amongst his people. And as we read from the Genesis accounts, we would notice and, and we observe how that God had always wanted to tabernacle with his people. He would come down in the cool of the evening to fellowship with Adam and Eve, isn't it? In the garden, in Eden, on the earth. Isn't it? When sin came in, Adam and Eve were, were driven out of the garden. But God made a way for them to return to him through the sacrifices. Those sacrifices were shadows and types of Christ. Even right until Moses came. It was during the, the, the revelation of the law at Mount Sinai that God then instituted the Mosaic Covenant as a proper covenant. But then, the Mosaic Covenant also had its system of worship, like the tabernacle. The tabernacle was the place, or was God's institution right, you know, for the people of God at the time, you know, as a place where he will meet with them. If we look at, uh,
Exodus Let me pull up the text. Exodus 25. Are we all there? Trying to see. Okay, so here God was giving them instruction on how to build the ark. Let's just quickly jump to chapter 40 to see when the ark was, the tabernacle was fully built. Exodus 40. We we'll read from verse 33. And he raised up the court all around the tabernacle and the altar and hung up the screen of the court gate. So Moses finished the work. Then the cloud covered the tabernacle of meeting and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And Moses was not able to enter the tabernacle of meeting because the cloud rested above it and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Okay? Now, prior to this, if you read the verses before, you would notice that Moses, having set up the tabernacle, right, with the ark in it, with the uh, tabernacle and the tent, the tabernacle was actually functional. The first offering was actually offered. And then what did we notice? The Shekinah glory of God came down to fill the place. Are you following? I mean, look at it in verse 27. And he burned sweet incense on it as the Lord had commanded Moses. Right? They had even burned sweet incense. Having set up the tabernacle, they put all the furnitures and utensils, right? And have even offered sacrifices. And then what happened? God's um, visible presence came down on it to what? To authenticate it. Now, this authentication or this visible manifestation of God's presence was to be a sign to the people that this is the institutionalized uh, means by which God will now fellowship with his people through that tabernacle. Are you following? We'll see that repeated also in the temple. All right? After Solomon builds the temple, what happened? The offerings were, were made, and before you knew it, God came down on the temple to authenticate it. And after that happened, the temple became the place where God's people met for communion with him. So in a sense, that became the institution of worship. Are you following? For God's people. Why? Because God has authenticated with, the, with his presence, and so therefore, the temple became the institutionalized worship system for God's people. And this continued till we get to Acts chapter 2. After Christ had set up his church in this world, the church was already functional. You know, a lot of people think that the, the church was born on Acts chapter 2. No. The gospel church was already functional before Acts 2. The gospel church already had its ministers. Christ had already appointed leaders among his people, had commissioned them. The church was commissioned in Matthew 28. Do you recall? When he says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me, go ye now therefore into the world 
and, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. So the church was already commissioned. The church already had a gospel. They already had the gospel. Are you following? They already had the gospel. They were missional. They had prayer meetings. Look at Acts 1. Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1. Are we there? Look at from 12, from verse 12. Well, let me just read from 13. And when they had entered, they went up into the upper room where they were staying. Peter, James, John, and Andrew, Philip, and Thomas, Bartholomew, and Matthew, James, the son of Alphaeus, and Simon, the zealot, and Judas, the son of James. These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. So they were already meeting for prayers. Right? So they had prayer meetings. And also, they had qualified pastors. Before Jesus left, he told Peter, Peter, do you love me? Peter said, you know I love you. What did he say? Feed my sheep. Peter, do you love me? Feed my sheep. Shepherd my sheep. And Peter, in his epistle, will also recognize himself as a fellow elder. They also observed the Lord's Supper. Jesus himself gave them the bread and the wine and said, this is my body. And when he gave them the cup, he said, this is the New Testament in my blood. They also held church business meetings. We see that in Acts chapter 1, from verse 15, when Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples and raised the need to appoint another replacement for Judas Iscariot. Now, a lot of people have said that the, that the church acted without the Holy Spirit, that Matthias was not recognized as an apostle. Right? Because the Holy Spirit hadn't been given. That's not correct. That's not correct. We don't see such account in Scripture. Right? Instead, we see the Bible authenticating even the office of Matthias. Because if you go to chapter 6, when um, the, the apostles will be, will, be, will be spoken of, we're told that the word the 12 was used. Right? Meaning Matthias was recognized. Are you following? As among the leadership of the church at the time. All right? I mean, there are many other uh, 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 qualities and qualifications that we see in scriptures. Also, they had church membership. They had church membership. In verse 15 that we read, it says, and this, uh, in those days, Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples. Altogether, the number of, of names was about 120. How did they know that they were about 120? There must have been a way that they kept record. But they knew that they were 120. They knew how many people were in the church. Right? So they had some, some way of knowing. And when Peter preached and 3,000 were added, how did they know that 3,000 men or souls were added to the church? There must have been a way that they kept record. And one of the ways was through baptism. Right? As people get baptized, because the baptism is the, is the way that you, you actually get into church membership. And several people have... Again, I guess because of time, I won't be able to treat this. Uh, maybe by the eyes I will. Um, but uh, the, uh, the, the argument here is that Christ had always had a church in the world and that the gospel church, you know, had existed even before Pentecost. So what happened at Pentecost was the authentication of the church as God did with the tabernacle and did with the temple and now he's doing that with the church in the gospel economy. 
to say that this is the new institution of worship for my people. And there are two instances where the word the baptism of Holy Spirit was used uh, in the book of Acts. It's during the ingathering of the Jews at Pentecost and during the ingathering of the Gentiles at the home of Cornelius. So God was authenticating to the world and saying that the church, the gospel church, is now the new institutionalized worship system for his people. Opened up to both Gentiles and Jews. And after that, the temple worship, the tabernacle, must all be phased out. And the writer to the Hebrews tells us clearly that there has been a clear transition from the Jewish church to the gospel church. Because the church is now, the gospel church is now the institutionalized worship system for God's people. And we have Christ as our head. Well, Christ as, our, as the head of the church. And Christ warned his people, don't call anybody rabbi. Don't call anybody teacher, for you have only one teacher. And Christ is our teacher. He is our prophet. But then, on this side of eternity, the visible church should aim to be pure and to be like the invisible church. My assumption is that we know the difference between the invisible and visible, right? But Eliezer has, has taken us through it. Isn't it? But our confession says that the purest churches under heaven are subject to mixture and error. Are subject to mixture and error. Just like the church in the wilderness, even when the, our Lord constituted the church, we had a Judas Iscariot. So the church will always face that risk of having unregenerate membership. But we must strive within our power as much as we can to ensure that the church is pure and that the church is made up of only regenerate people. The only criteria to be a member of the church is that you've been regenerated, is that you've experienced the circumcision of the hearts. Are we following? Just like in the Mosaic Covenant, the sign of that covenant, or the, the means by which you enter that covenant, was circumcision. But in the New Covenant, the means by which you enter that covenant is the circumcision of the hearts, not water baptism for children. No. So, and that's why we say one of the requirements before you become a member is to check your confession, that you truly understand the gospel, right? And that you have a testimony in about the gospel. That's all we can hold on to, right? Uh, and we trust the Lord to, to um, add to his church. Look, I think we've exceeded our time. Um, let's just talk about the second part. It says, and some have degenerated so much that they have ceased to be churches of Christ and have become synagogues of Satan. Just to say again that the church on this side of eternity will always have mixture and error. Mixture in its members, right? Um, and also errors. But Christ has said that he will build his church. And the way he does that is through the ministry of the word as his people hold his word forth. I think it's also important to, to emphasize this. That the reformers had uh, about three criteria for, or three marks for the true church. And the first two is uh, faithfulness to the preaching of God's word and obedience to the hearing of God's word. But he also added a third one, which is church discipline. All right? Um, it's important to note that the holiness of the church is not dependent on its ministers. 
Are we following? It's not. In, in the first week in September, our brother, Eliezer, will be ordained a pastor in this church, right? The church does not stand and fall on his holiness, on his personal holiness, neither on the personal holiness of anybody. Are you following? Holiness of the church is both a gift and a call to duty. God has made his church holy because he has called them out and also has called them to pursue holiness. So when we talk about the holiness of the church, and if you look at the Nicene Creed, so we believe in one holy Catholic church. There's holiness there as an adjective qualifying the church. The church is holy because God himself has, has chosen to be present in the church, has chosen to manifest himself in and through the church. Are we following? And through the preaching of his word. So long as the word of God is preached faithfully and the members and the hearers exercise personal faith in what is preached, the personal holiness of the preacher does not, does not um, weaken the potency of God's word preached. God is the one who opposes church. And yes, you and I as members have the responsibility to ensure that what is being preached from the pulpits aligns with the scripture. Are we following? Secondly, with the ordinances as well. The Lord's Supper being presented doesn't depend on the holiness of the ministers, but on the one who has commanded it. Are we following? And yes, as a church, we must hold our ministers accountable to the standard revealed in Scripture, and we also must be on the watch for one another and pray for one another. But you're not going to find a perfect church. Even though Charles Spurgeon said this, but it's not attributed to him, he said, if you find a perfect church, don't attend, lest you make it imperfect. And there will be errors, even in our doctrines. We do not say that anybody who does not subscribe to 1689 London Baptist Confession of Faith, right, uh, is not a believer. There are churches that don't subscribe to 1689 London Baptist Confession of Faith. There are churches that believe, that hold on to some teachings that we may, we may find erroneous, but they are Christian churches. So long as the gospel is preached right. Are we following? Is the gospel preached? Is Christ truly Lord in those churches? Is the word of God given the centrality in those, in those churches? Are uh, those churches where Christ is Lord just on the signboard? Right? But when you come to the pulpit, what you are hearing is not Christ is Lord. What you are hearing is the man teaching you how to become a billionaire. Right? Or how we can transfer the wealth of the Gentiles to the church. And some of them have good intentions. They tell you, oh, that by this we want to show the world that our God reigns. And they fall into the error of Balaam. Brothers and sisters, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. We must not start looking for carnal means like the Pharisees and Sadducees or like the Rom- Roman church who use political means to coerce people to, 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 to subscribe to Christianity. No. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal but they are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. It's through the foolishness of preaching that God is saving his people. We must ensure that the word of God preached is faithful and we are faithful to the revealed word. 
in both preaching and in our obedience and hearing of the gospel. For through that Christ will build his church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. However, there are some that have degenerated so much that they have ceased to be churches of Christ and have become synagogues of Satan. I know I've said that there are some churches that may have some errors, but they are still Christian churches, right? But there are some that can be called churches. When the reformers or the particular Baptist fathers were writing this, they had the Roman church in mind. Because the Roman church declared the gospel anathema. See, anybody who holds on to the gospel, that salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, for the glory of God alone, let him be anathema. Are we following? But in our own day, we must fight the same fights. There are places that we can't call, this, that we can't call a, a, a church. They are synagogues of Satan. The reformers, and they've done their parts. Now it's our, our time. And it's through the church that God is advancing his kingdom. In the Lord's prayer, the Lord Jesus taught us to pray that thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. How God's kingdom is being advanced is through the church, the church militants. And how do we advance the kingdom? Not by carnal means, but by relying on the ordinances that our Savior has given us, the preaching of God's word. The preaching of God's word. So, brothers and sisters, while the church may have mixture and error, the word of God presents the church to us as a community of saints that we must hold in honor and we must associate ourselves with it. In the Psalms that we read before we started the doctrinal class, I'll just wrap up with that Psalm. Psalm 48, from verse 4. For behold, the kings assembled, they passed by together, they saw it, and so they marveled, they were troubled, they hastened away. Fear took hold of them there, and pain as of a woman in birth, in birth pangs, as when you break the ships of Tarshish with an east wind. The church also has its enemies. And these are the enemies of Christ. Those who have said that Christ will not rule over us. They also hate the church. They are scheming to, to adulterate the gospel. Right? So what you have is that you have these hierarchies. Right? We see that in the Roman, Roman Catholic Church. We see that even happening in um, uh, the Presbyterians. Right? Arguments about, you know, should we redefine you know, gender, should we redefine what marriage is, all that is happening. What we see in scripture is that every local church, we see two offices, pastor and deacons. Look at that in Philippians 1, Philippians 1, 1, right? I mean, Brother I will take us through, through this as we continue um, the other paragraphs. As we have heard, so we have seen in the city of the Lord of hosts, in the city of our God, God will establish it forever. We have, th we, have thought, we have thought, O God, on your loving kindness in the midst of your temple. According to your name, O God, so is your praise to the ends of the earth. Your right hand is full of righteousness. Let Mount Zion rejoice. Let the daughters of Judah be glad because of your judgment. Walk about Zion and go all around her. Count her towers. Mark well her bulwarks. Consider her palaces, that you may tell it to the generation following. For this is God, our God forever and ever. He will be our guide even to death. Amen. We see the glory of the church presented to us in this psalm. Well, the psalmist begins with the glory of the church's Lord and God and ends with the glory of of the church's Lord and God. 
begins with his, with his greatness and ends with his goodness. And here he's telling us that God has chosen to make his glory known and seen through the church. Through the church. We must hold the church in high honor and must also seek to associate ourselves with the church wherever we are. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, indeed you've been good to us. We're thankful for the privilege to be numbered amongst your people. You have chosen to make your grace known in your church. Please, Father, help each and every one of us to contemplate on this truth. Help us to rest on your promise that you will build your church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And Lord, we're thankful for this local church and for how you have sustained us through the years. For you indeed have been our shepherd. Oh, that you will establish the work that you've begun. How we desire to be a people who know you truly and who worship you in truth and godly fear. We're asking that you help. Help us as a church. You know our many weaknesses. Build us, O oh Lord, and make us your holy habitation, a place where your spirit is pleased to dwell. And if there be any in our midst who do not know you, Oh, may you be gracious and open their eyes to see the King in his glory. May they bow their knees in penitence to our Savior and King. Oh, save, O oh Lord, save. Save sinners unto yourself. May they know the pardon of sin that you offer. May they know the peace that you offer. And as we continue the, the worship service, O oh Father, strengthen the faith of your people. May our love for you be found aflamed. And may our hope be sharpened. Please glorify your Son in our midst, our Father. In Jesus' name and for his sake we've prayed. Amen.